In the war between comic book publishers and their subsequent movies, there's a constant state of one-upmanship. I see your origin story and raise you a superhero group movie. Or I see your light-hearted sense of humor and raise you Will Smith. But in their bid to outdo one another, sometimes they all end up feeling the same. Borrowing ideas, either planned or by chance, and it all ends up whiffing of a group of young schoolboys copying each other's homework. Well, lads, the headmaster's here to deliver a good dose of cerebral punishment and out these copycat mannerisms. With this in mind, I'm JulesWhatCulture.com and this is 10 ways that comic book movies totally ripped each other off. Number 10. Making Really Awkward Puberty Allegories the odd consequence of Hollywood's fascination with rebooting superhero movies or concentrating mostly on their origins and formative years is that the primary theme in 90% of them is now a thinly veiled puberty allegory. In the X-Men, teenage mutants come to terms with their bodies being different, Wolverine, Superman and Batman all embark on journeys to find themselves, and Spider-Man goes so far as to make masturbation jokes about Spidey's web-slinging. It's now got to that stage where every superhero movie with half an eye on origins will present that arc as a puberty allegory. Number 9. The Ballsy Investigation who knows their secret. There's apparently always someone in a superhero movie who can ignore the conventions that turn everyone else into an empty-headed moron incapable of seeing that Clark Kent is just Superman with glasses. Daredevil had Ulrich, Man of Steel had Lois Lane, The Dark Knight had Coleman Reese, all curious little sprites who ignore the seemingly obvious threat of now jumping the queue to receive a supervillain beating. And very few of these nosy lots seem to acknowledge that uncovering the truth and pretty much going directly to the source without safeguarding themselves is probably suicide. It's all part of the archetype of these type of films, alongside the dead parents and the plucky sidekick, but still, these regulars looking for answers should probably invest in life insurance. Number 8. The Seemingly Impossible Choice Superheroes are invariably split personalities, and it's not a superhero movie without a choice which will ask them to make a tough decision between the two. The Dark Knight, Batman and Robin, Spider-Man 1, 2 and 3 all present a Sophie's choice between doing the right thing and saving the girl, or Robin in the case of Batman and Robin. Of course it's fine anyway, because any time a superhero is faced with a seemingly definitive choice, most of the time there'll be a loophole that the villain didn't notice, meaning that the choice isn't really there to begin with. The obvious exception of course is the Joker's Rachel slash Harvey conundrum that's always going to come at a fatal cost. But then again, Nolan's Joker is an entirely different caliber of villain. Number 7. Sexuality Trumps Intelligence Despite the fact that superheroes are not all James Bond, in the interest of adding another level to their power, there's a worrying number of moments in comic book movie history where even the most intelligent heroes are willing to entirely give up on their duty for a sniff of femininity. In The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Peter turns his back on Captain Stacy's dying request to keep his daughter out of harm because he finds her sexually irresistible. And in The Dark Knight Rises, Bruce Wayne suspends his label of the world's greatest detective in order to do a Bond and bed Talia al Ghul without so much as a whiff of precedent. In fact, Batman has actually fallen into this trap several times before, allowing Vicky Vale to roam the world with his secret because she's pretty, and not to mention Poison Ivy's effect on both he and Robin. Number 6. Mirroring the Hero For all the breadth of the colourful, varied rogues gallery of villains that have appeared in comic book movies, there's something that unifies a significant number of them. They're just like the heroes. The appeal of casting a villain who shares similarities is of course entirely justifiable. Darth Vader is all the more compelling because of the capacity for Luke to become him, and it's invariably the villains who blur the lines between good and evil who become the most popular. And that's exactly why we've seen villains in comic book movies who are dark mirrors of the heroes. Eddie Brock to Peter Parker, the Winter Soldier to Captain America, Nuclear Man to Superman. And despite the fact that some have been far from successful, filmmakers can't resist the temptation to continue this trend. Number 5. Reducing Bane to a slave of his loins. Not once, but twice, Bane has been shown to be more interested in his sexual organs than his traditionally voracious need to take down Batman. Obviously, suggesting that Schumacher and Nolan's versions of the character are even remotely similar is pretty laughable, but it's true in both cases that Bane ends up to be an unlikely bedfellow for both the female villains of the movies. There might be more subtlety and intellect in the way that Nolan portrayed his version of the character, but in making the Nightfall arc no more than a step in Talia's grander plan, he made Bane a lovesick sidekick just as Schumacher's dayglow monster in Batman and Robin was presented. Number 4. Your origin is not the whole story, it's also in your genes. Superhero origins used to be a pretty definitive thing. Batman came from parental murder, Superman is an alien orphan, Spider-Man was bitten by a spider and the Hulk was zapped with gamma radiation and gifted super stretchy trousers. But then Hollywood decided to change things up in a couple of cases. Batman is still the product of murder and Superman is still an alien, but both Spidey and the Hulk were given new elements to their origins. In Ang Lee's underappreciated but not exactly excellent Hulk, it showed that Bruce Banner was already genetically mutated thanks to his father's experiments. And the amazing 
Amazing Spider-Man suggested that Peter might be somehow linked to his father's dalliance with science. The end result is that the impact is taken out of the origin triggers, and we get a surprise dampening revelation that they were probably already destined for greatness. Number 3. The Ringtone Gag Musical gags have always been a big part of the Spider-Man movie presence, with the Spider-Man theme tune being given a number of reboots to appear in the Sam Raimi and Mark Webb Spider franchises. But Webb took the musical joking a step further by stealing a gag from Iron Man, which saw a classic version of a cartoon theme being used as a ringtone. It was funny in Iron Man for die-hard fans, but in Amazing Man Spider the sequel the movie, it was a little phoned in. Oh, that's right. He's back again. Number 2. Casting John Favreau as an assistant Favreau will likely be remembered for his directorial role in shaping Iron Man and his on-screen representation of the most comically out-of-shape bodyguard ever, Happy Hogan. But it actually goes beyond these two roles. Long before he grew into Happy's considerable frame and even before he was added to Daredevil as comic relief in the shape of Foggy Nelson, Favreau was in a DC movie. In Batman Forever, Favreau pops up in the background of the scene in which Bruce Wayne meets Edward Nigma, strutting with an oddly confident gait for a man listed merely as assistant in the credits. And number one, gigantic fiery street art. Remember that moment in The Dark Knight Rises when Batman announced his return to Gotham by burning a great big bat symbol into the city? That seems like a lot of time and effort which could have been spent, you know, saving people. Then Spider-Man did largely the same thing in Amazing Spider-Man 2. And we were left thinking, hmm, we've seen this before, bit of a copycat here. Well, only if we think that Batman was the first to do it. The Punisher was actually the first to leave a huge calling card manipulating some explosions to make it look like his flaming skull ident. And it's a terrible film to be sure, but it's clear the bat was watching Notebook at the Ready. And that's our list. Got any more times when comic book heroes copied one another? Well, let us know about them in the comments section below. And if you want to come tell me about how I'm a ripoff of Lex Luthor, then you can do so on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero. If you enjoyed the video, then like, share, and subscribe for more. As always, I've been Jules for WhatCulture.com, and I'll see you soon.